has given us. I am so excited that you are here, whether you're live with us or whether you're joining us on our uh, Facebook live stream or later on on our YouTube channel. Call the 
upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. Oh, shall I be saved from my enemy? I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and the God of my salvation. chapter, and King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading for today comes from Hebrews, the fourth chapter. You don't need to stand, it's not gospel. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every high priest chosen from among the mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness and because of this must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also in Christ, so also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest but was appointed by one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says, also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In those days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today's today's prayer of the day, yeah, I know. My microphone is on. I'm sorry. So folks. 
folks, if you can't hear who are in the sanctuary, move up. <laughs> um, and I will, I will preach from the ambo so that you can hear at least that word. So as, as today's prayer of the day mentions, we, we get to sit and be in God's gentle arms. And so in my office, I actually have from Peru this little statue that was made um, that has Jesus and the children. And it always reminds me of the fact that when Jesus was alive, he was not afraid to take children who were considered non-human and bless them, right? And bring them into his gentle arms and teach them. Because after all, who's more wise about who Jesus is than kids, right? Because they take and understand the love of Jesus in a way that most adults struggle with. Because somehow or another, as we got older, our logic interfered with our understanding of the depth of God's love. So I love the fact that this statue reminds me that all of us, right, all of us, whether we recognize it up here or not, are safe in the arms of Jesus. We've now hit the midpoint of our five-week study in this amazing book of Hebrews. We are today focusing on the high priestly nature of Jesus, who, as Christians believe, was both fully God and fully human. As an aside, I've been reading the, this book um, this week entitled Priscilla's Letter, Finding the Author of the Epistle to Hebrews. And it's a scholarly work written by Ruth Hoppen where she systematically lays out an argument that Priscilla, wife of Aquila and companion of both Timothy and Paul, is its author. I find it fascinating because it gives plausible explanations for the reason why this book, so important in the New Testament canon, is anonymous. And why Priscilla just might be the author for the writing's sake. So indulge me if every once in a while I call the author she. So let's talk about Melchizedek, who is referenced both in our first lesson and in our Hebrews lesson for today. He was both the king of Salem, which in Hebrew means peace, and it's a town that's been mentioned several times in the Bible, as well as the high priest of El El Nyon, which translated into English is God Most High. Now remember, whenever we hear an English word with the word, letters E-L in it, L, it's always reference to God. So think of Joel, right? No, uh, no, I mean, all of those, Noel, all of those words, they really reference God. So um, our first reading for today is the first time Melchizedek is mentioned in the Bible. Here he brought bread and wine. Does that sound sacramental to you? Like it does to me? Bread and wine? To the, <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> now you're making me laugh. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> he brought bread and wine to Abram. Now notice that this is Abram and not Abraham, right? So this is before the covenant got really strengthened with Abram. So, and Melchizedek, is also, also blesses El, El Yon, i.e. God Most High, at this time. Abraham blessed Melchizedek in return and gives him a tithe of what he has, which may have included a, an awful lot of stuff because he had just fought the kingdom of Elam and probably was bringing back with him spoils of war. What do you think it would have been like to have been both king and priest? How easy do you think it is to bring together the affairs of both the church and the state? 
We do know that there have been others throughout history who have worn both the mitre and the crown, and almost always it was not an easy thing to do. Melchizedek shows up more than once in the Old Testament, Psalm 110, verse 4, which says, The Lord, Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, to whom is the psalmist referring? Some scholars say it's King David, while others say it refers back to Abram. In Hebrews, in the second text that I read for you today, the writer believes that the psalmist is actually prophesying or foreshadowing Jesus. What can we glean from this reference to Melchizedek that this author really knows is in the Bible? We have two pretty obscure references to some priest, bishop, prince, bishop, and she pulls them from scripture to help people understand who Jesus is. Can I just say, wow? High priests had specific jobs that they had to do, according to our scriptures. First of all, they had to be from Aaron's lineage and without any physical defect. They carried out all of the administrative duties of the temple. And one of the things in, in Bible study that I've said is you need to understand that the temple complex is as big as if we started here, went all the way down Ster uh, Stearns to Palo Verde and all the way over to Long Beach State and came back, right? So it's a huge complex, right? great amount of people and events happening simultaneously on this uh, acreage, right? So that was what their first thing. The high priest also um, had to know what each priest's job was and how it was being rightly administrated. In other words, that the sacrifices were properly completed and accepted. The high priest also had the privilege of wearing the Urim and the Thummim, which are engraved dice like stones that were used to determine truth or falsity and thereby determining the will of God. The high priest also had to offer sin offering, not only for the sins of all of the people of Israel, but for himself as well. And most of all, the high priest was to conduct the most holy service on the most holy day throughout Jewish history and understanding, which is the Day of Atonement, that tenth day of the seventh month of every year. The high priest and the high priest alone was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies behind that veil and stand before God and offer sacrifices and prayers. I also think it's really interesting to know that the high priest went in with a rope on his foot just in case he passed out the priests that were standing outside the veil could pull him out because they dare not enter. And from this last and most sacred and most important duty of the high priest, this author of Hebrews puts the office of the great high priest on Jesus. Why is this so important? Remember that this book was probably written after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And with that destruction, there is no more holy of holies. There is no more high priestly duties. Who can God's people turn to when the temple is gone? This author beautifully reminds us that we turn to Jesus who is the great high priest according to Melchizedek's standards. Jesus who was completely human, who shared our every human weakness, who knew our human suffering, who walked on this planet living as a Jew under Roman occupation, who wept and laughed and mourned and shared jokes with his family and friends who taught us about God's loving way of forgiveness, life, and salvation. We turn to Jesus, whose death, resurrection, and ascension 
meant that he was no longer bound to any temple made of stone or made of flesh and blood. Jesus was the great high priest for the world. And it's to this Jesus that we get to pray. It's to this Jesus that we sing our songs. It's to this Jesus that we cling when the world is rocking, when it's swaying and it's messy. Jesus knows our every weakness. He knows just how many hairs are on our heads. Jesus knows the depth of our emptiness and he knows the height of our ecstasy. And it's because of Jesus, what he taught and how he lived his life that we can move out of our natural inclination to be all about me and to move into being and understanding it's all about we. It's because of Jesus that we can do what Martin Luther told us in almost every explanation of the Ten Commandments, which is we are to love God and love our neighbor so that we work for their welfare. Well, how do we do this? Well, we look to Jesus, our great high priest, read what he did in the Gospels, and then strive to follow as best we can what Jesus did and said and how Jesus lived his life, caring for those in deepest need, whether that be physical, mental, spiritual, relational, or emotional. We get close to God. We get close to Jesus by praying, singing, and hanging out with people who, and asking them about their relationship to God by believing deep in our being that the Holy Spirit is indeed with us every step, every breath, every day. Our baptisms say this is true. But I wonder, I wonder this morning, have we really let the Holy Spirit fully into our lives? Or have we kept the Holy Spirit in a closet in our being? This is really not a scary thing, you know. What allowing the Holy Spirit fully into our lives does not mean is that we are becoming so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean that we have to speak in tongues and perform miracles. It does not mean we have to wear signboards or speak with bullhorns in large crowds about God. I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty happy. What being filled with the Spirit does mean is that we, with all humility and all boldness and all joy, can live out our everyday lives in our everyday vocations simultaneously. We get to bear amazing fruit like, yeah, that was not tongues, by the way. Well, maybe my tongue getting confused, but uh, we get to bear fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, and self-control. And as that beautiful African spiritual says, come, come, come Holy Spirit, come, come, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Help us. Help us, Jesus, to boldly follow you, our great high priest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please join us as we sing, Come Ye Disconsolate, hymn number 607.
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take that position for prayer that is most comfortable and appropriate for you. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all creation. God of wisdom, enlighten your Church. Guide theologians, biblical scholars, authors, and seminary professors as they seek greater knowledge and invite others into deeper understanding. Teach us to ask faithful questions and open our minds to new ideas. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, direct our leaders. Grant them courage to lay aside political grudges and renew their determination to address difficult conflicts. Guide them in the work of reconciliation. Protect those that direct their lives to protect and defend those in places of war and division. We pray especially for those serving as first responders in the peace and diplomatic corps and in our nation's military, especially Jason, Samuel, Rachel, and Victor, Michael, Aaron, William, Damian, Gabriel, Richard, Chandler, John, Brittany, Davis, Morgan, Haley, Johnny, Brina, Sean, Emily, Brina, Stephen, Andrew, Michael, Joseph, Jim, Sophie, Douglas, Dominic, Jonah, and Colin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, tend to the wounded. Rescue those tormented by mental illness or mired in addiction. Ease the anxiety of those struggling with dementia. Come quickly to help all who are grieving and all those who suffer, especially Justin, Judy, Ione, Carol, and Francis, Deb, Adam, Daniel, Phil, Harriet, Barry, and Janice, Gary, and Linda, Marilyn, Terry, Lottie, Jerry, Cheryl, Marilyn, Zach, Clara, and John, Dick, and Nancy, Charlie, and David, Mary, and Max, Rosemary, John, Becky, Tamara, Christy, and Carl, Brecken, Alberta, Cindy, Abby, Bobby, Ben, Bill, and Teria, Kylie, and Crystal, Jody, Victoria, Doris, DJ, Peggy, Barb, Shirley, Adam, the Alderson family, Paula, Katrina, Barb, Mike, Christina, and Scott, Debbie, Bob, Joanna, and Ethan, Casey, and Mark, Beth, Anna, Steve, and Jenny, as well as those we name aloud before you now or in the presence uh, or in the silence of our hearts. Preserve too those that serve those in need in our community through their service at Lutheran Social Services, California Lutheran Homes, Christian Outreach in Action, Habitat for Humanity, and New Life Beginnings. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. God of beauty, inspire artists. Bless those whose visual and musical gifts enliven this assembly. We think this day especially of John August Watson. Bless too the creative work of poets, hymn writers, composers, painters, sculptors, and others that enrich our worship and daily life. And give us words and actions that express our thanks for the gifts they offer us and others. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day specifically for the countries of Haiti, devastated last week by yet another earthquake and a hurricane heading toward this poverty-stricken land, and also for Afghanistan, so devastated by war. And now for our president. Bless the people of these lands with what they need to survive and give them courage to rebuild their countries so that there is equity for all people. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our world is on fire, O Lord. Bless firefighters in all of the countries, in all of the places that are burning. 
them safe and strengthen them as they work so diligently. Give them clarity in how to manage and then to snuff out these fires. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of resurrection, bring us to new life. Give us the living bread from heaven through which we abide in your love. And on the last day, raise us with all the saints to eternal life. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sin. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember Jesus until he comes again. Let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of God, who provides for us, who heals us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Our sending song this morning is Praise, Praise, Praise the Lord. This is not a song you can sing sitting down, so please stand and pray. <laughs> Thank you. 